Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Welcome to our first event in the 2013 Weber Days. And let me just give you a little bit of information about Irving Weber. And if you want a lot more information about Irving Weber, you can go to icpl.org. And on our homepage, there's a little link here that says Weber Days. If you click on that through the magic of the internet. And then click up here. It has a lot more links about Irving Weber. So there's a brief piece about Irving Weber. Irving Weber's books. Someone did ask me this evening where you can buy Irving Weber's books. Um, they're not being printed any longer. If you contact the noon host Lions Club, they may have some available to sell. They often appear at garage sales. Sometimes we have them in our, our used bookstore, the bookend. We have videos about and by Irving Weber, and these stream off of our website, so they can you can watch them in your home at well, you wouldn't watch them at work because I know when you're at work, you're all working. But <clears throat> the beauty of these is that you can, if you find something that's really interesting and you want to share it with others, they're available on the website. So video.icpl.org. Video and uh, they're some of our most popular ones. So please do explore that. And then some Iowa City history links as well. So Irving Weber lived his entire life in Iowa City. Actually, I should probably do this as a quiz to see how many of you know about Irving Weber. And we celebrate him for, for many, many reasons. He was a local historian. He wrote for the Iowa City Press did a citizen. He started in January of 1973. And he wrote more than 700 or 800 columns for the press citizen. And he was a um, citizen historian. And so there are some people who find things that aren't particularly as accurate as they might be. But we like that aspect of Irving Weber's Iowa City. and. Um, we uh, do caution people that sometimes they might want to, to double check some of their facts, but he has done so much for the, the preservation of Iowa City history. And we have an entire book about Irving Weber called Irving Weber's, Iowa City's Irving Weber, a biography that was written by Lolly Eggers, who is the library director emeritus, emeriti of the Iowa City Public Library. And that's, it's a fascinating book. We have it in our reference collection and we have it as a circulating item as well. And he, Irving died in 1997. He was almost 100 years old. So in order to celebrate local history, we thought that putting Irving Weber with it would be the best draw that we could have. <clears throat> so tonight is our first program in Irving Weber Days 2013. Tomorrow night, Tim Welsh from the retired director of the Hoover Presidential Library. We'll be speaking about presidential libraries. And then on Thursday night, we're very excited. We're launching our local, our, our local, excuse me, our Iowa City Digital History Project. And that is a new initiative for the Iowa City Public Library. And we have a number of collections that were loaned to us by the Johnson County Historical Society. One is a film about the need for building a new high school from the 1930s. It was about the controversy over building City High. And if you've been following in the newspapers, it's the, it may be almost a century later, but the, the same issues are still relevant now that were relevant then. And so please come, if you can, to that program or watch it live or explore our website. And you can become citizens and do crowdsourcing of those photographs that we will have up because we'll need lots and lots of help with the public for those, from those. And then next Thursday night, on the 30th, we have a genealogy program. So if you're interested in doing learning about your family and you want to learn how to use the resources at the Iowa City Public Library, you can do that too. But enough about our Irving Webber programs. Irving Webber programs, let's get to tonight's program. Our speaker is Nancy Kraft. She is a strong advocate for preservation, having worked 20 years for the State Historical Society of Iowa and presently head of preservation, the Preservation Department for the University of Iowa Libraries. In 2006, she received the University of Iowa President's Award for State Outreach and Public Engagement for her many interrelated contributions to the preservation and accessibility of historical sources in Iowa. And if you're in the library world, you are so grateful to Nancy because of her work in preservation of, of local newspapers and starting that project in Iowa. In 2009, she received the Midwest Archives Conference President's Award for her extraordinary work following the historic levels of flooding that struck Iowa in the summer <clears throat> of 2008. And in fact, on the listserv today, she sent out information for, 
libraries that have needs from tornadoes. So she continues to work on disaster preservation, but also what happens when a disaster strikes. She has published a number of articles on preservation and presented workshops on a variety of themes from disaster recovery to film preservation. For the past three years, she has taught a week-long preservation class for the Ocean Teachers Academy, Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission, UNESCO, Austin, Belgium, and acted as one of their consultants. Nancy holds an MA in Library Science from the University of Iowa and a BA from the University of South Dakota in Russian and Library Science. Thank you, Nancy. Yeah, you didn't put me on. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh, yeah, I should have done right that. Right there. All right. Right there. Okay. Okay. All right. Good evening. I want to kind of rush you through an overview of caring for your collections at home because we have experts here to get in depth uh, with any of your particular interests. So, um, the first thing that we talk about at work and I talk with uh, people who are talk thinking about starting a preservation program for themselves is, is to think about why are you saving an object or your, your photographs? How will it be used? How much time and money are you willing to put into it? What's the value of the item? And the thing that I like to stress most is pick something that's going to work best for you. Uh, what might work for me, a, a way that I'm organizing or preserving, might not work for you or for your neighbor. So really think about, is this something I want to launch into? Will I stick at it? Will I enjoy it? Or are there other things I'd rather emphasize in, in my life? So, so really think about these things before you start. A project at home. I like to use this as an example of um, why are you saving it and how are you going to save it. My grandfather lived to be a hundred and there was the, the, our local newspaper had the whole newspaper was devoted to him. Then an area newspaper did one little article. So what I wanted to do was I decided that the whole entire newspaper from the local town was what I wanted to save. And I wanted to spend a little money on it because it was very important and I wanted to keep it for my children and grandchildren. So I took it to a local conservator and had the whole nine yards, I spent a bunch of money, had it deacidified and enclosed in plastic so that um, I could keep it for, for a long time. And yeah, let's see if this will work for you. But you see, I drove back across South Dakota in a station wagon, and look what edge was showing. It slipped out of its box, and just in one day, that's how much it yellowed. Um, so anyway, a little side note. But uh, and then I decided I just wanted to keep just the article for the for the. Uh, uh, area newspaper. So those are some of the kinds of things that you go through as you decide how much money and effort and what kinds of things you're going to, going to keep. I also need to put a little effort into creating a good environment. The main thing, you probably already know this, is to avoid extremes in temperature and humidity, which typically means keep things out of the attics and basements. Um, but sometimes our our newer basements also have good, good uh, control, so that's not always true. You should try to keep your temperature below 75 degrees. Cooler is better. And you can vary it from winter to summer a little bit, um, but if, really avoid extremes. And then if you can um, uh, control your relative humidity, that's a good thing. Uh, try to keep it between 30 and 60 percent, but most of us here in Iowa don't have that luxury. Um, and I'll talk about containers and things like that that will help buffer the effects of an environment that you're not completely in control of. Avoid or minimize light. You saw what happened when my newspaper slipped out of its box. Keep things away from food. Keep things dust-free 
and then monitor your collection to make sure there's not anything going wrong. I like to use this illustration because these two books are both, uh, I think it's uh, uh, 1875, so that means they both had about 100 years of no air conditioning. But the top one, you can see, is in much better condition than the lower one. And that's because the people that were in charge of this, the top one, always followed whatever were the current practices for keeping uh, your collection intact. So when, when they found out that light was damaging, they kept it out of the light and turned the lights off. Um, and when there was air conditioning, they kept it cool, and they also limited how much people could handle it. Now, on the other hand, the lower one didn't pay any attention to, any, to whatever the current trends were, and they kept their room uh, cool year-round with the window open, and then the dust came in. So just, some, just taking some very simple steps will... Uh, extend the life of your materials. Um, dirt will attract uh, insects and mold. And so none of us like to dust, but dusting more than once a year is recommended. <laughs> um, my, when my mother passed away, my, my dad closed up the upstairs and wouldn't let any of us into my mom's book collection until I think it was three years later. And we saw a little sawdust around the books, which meant that we had gotten bookworms, larvae, in, and they'd start eat, eating away at the books. So even if you've got things tucked away, you need to monitor. This is a, a, a sample of mold. Uh, we saw the most, at least I got the most reports of mold in Iowa in 1970, or 1993 when it had all the flooding because it never got warm, much past 80 degrees, and most people, good Iowans, saved money and didn't turn the air conditioner on. Well, it was also very humid, so we had a lot of mold outbreaks. And the best way is to keep your air conditioner on. That does help dry things out in the summer. Uh, also, monitor, because mold likes stagnant air, humidity, uh, and dark. So one of the things you can do is, if, if you've got a room that's a little stagnant, either you know, move your stuff out or you know, have a fan in there, uh, especially in August in Iowa seems to be prime time. For items that, that you're really wanting to keep for the long term, you need to handle as little as possible. And your hands should be free of lotion. Um, Store unfolded whenever possible, and if you think you have something of value and you want to keep it, it's best to consult an expert to verify. There are a lot of imitation and reprints, so it's best to consult. And then also, repairs and restoration are best left to experts. And we'll do a little bit on um, photographs. A friend of mine, I was president of the Iowa Library Association, and a friend of mine took a whole bunch of pictures, and then you can see he wrote on the back, so I'd know what they were, but he didn't use uh, permanent ink. And so look what happened. He stacked them up, and so now I've got the ink on the front side of the photos. So if you're marking photographs, make sure that you have a permanent ink or um, older pictures, you might be able to use pencil along the edge or if you can put them in an envelope to, to identify them, but be really careful about that. Uh, photographs, color photographs will fade even if they're in the dark. It's just the nature of, of, of the photograph. But if you have a negative, you can take it and get another print and that's that's what I did um, to, to bring it out just a little bit. So that's my wedding. Um, and then don't forget if you've got a photograph that you really care about and it's, and it's disintegrating like this is, it had a really poor chemical process. 
It was my sister and, and her husband and friends were in Deadwood and they, you know, they did the tourist thing and had their photograph and it was uh, uh, in brown tone and she sent it to me and said, can you get this fixed? I hung on to it for several years until digital restoration came around and then was able to uh, have the University of Iowa Photo Lab here restore it for me. Uh, what they did was they made a digital copy, filled it in, and made a new copy for me. So you can also do that. Uh, some people want to, especially if they see some damage down here, try to pull photos off, off the cardboard of, the old, of their old pictures. It's really best to just leave things as is. That damage is not harming the photo. And this, the photograph is on extremely thin paper. And if you try to take it off, you're going to lose the image. It's better to take a make a copy of the image if you're worried about it. But it's best. There's no evidence of any damage going on. And it's really best just to leave thing, you know, well enough alone. The same way with photo albums. Uh, this is a... Well, I'm not going to tell you how old this is. Uh, <laughs> this is me in first grade, uh, me. <laughs> so, but there's no damage evidenced in this album. So all I did was have a box made to give it extra protection. And, and, so, and then it's done. Uh, for my family, I did an elaborate plan that worked for a few years. But what I did was I just made my own little photo album, uh, and I, I labeled, labeled them. I put the, the um, and saved the negatives. And then the photographs that I decided not to use, I just put into an archival envelope. And that freed me from having to put everything into an, into an album. But I still was able to keep all of them, and I just selected some out that I wanted. And that way, I, I don't know, it was too burdening to me to have to put everything in an album. It was easier just to be selective. Um, so I just had a little system that I used where I took the photographs out of what came in the envelope from the photographer, put it in an archival envelope, made some notes, and put them in this box. And then I'm done. I put them in date order. And then as I had time, I, I just did a little drawing pad instead of spending a lot of money and uh, put them in there. And then that's where I kept my uh, negatives. Like, say, it worked for me. And that's where it shows where um, I took the envelope. I put the negatives. But there's also in this a little pocket where I could have put the negatives. So again, it's, it's up to what will work for you. Now, I made my own from 100% from uh, cotton acid-free drawing pads, very simple, cost me three, four, five dollars. But the inside is, is uh, acidic, so I left the front and back page blank for extra protection. And even if you have an archival envelope, that's really good to do because that's where most of your wear and tear comes, and that's the page that's most likely to fall. So one or two pages at the front and back is really good. Um, when you're selecting your album, um, make sure that you can expand it so, it'll, so your photos can lay flat to avoid distorting. And see the strap? This one has a strap that you can adjust. This one has pages that you can tear out so that as you add into the album. But it's just something to look, look at as you're picking out al albums that you want to use. I also want to caution you to read the labels as you're selecting your photo albums. Some, this album down here, it was advertised as professional album. I thought, well, that sounds pretty good. So I, I bought it, but I had a, a pen that I purchased. Uh, maybe I should pass something around here you can play with. But um, I have a 
a pH pen that you can get that's not bad to have that you can test your products. It does leave a, a mark if it's purple, which most of your stuff, including my bills, are acid free and going to last for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> which is, it's very annoying. But you can see, you have to test in a place where it's not going to be very visible. So here, I tested this, this wonderful professional album, and it turned yellow, which means it's very acidic. So you have to be really careful and read, read your labeling. Uh, call the manufacturer. Find out how it was made. Now, one of the popular things at least in my childhood, was to, ha to have a scrapbook. And what I chose to do with my kids is to have a keepsake box instead of a scrapbook. There again, I didn't have to make decisions and be selective and spend time laying things out. And look at all the different things that I could put in there. And the kids loved, I put their little uh, first grade or kindergarten picture on the front, and they loved pulling these boxes out and looking through their grades or first grade or music contest things. And it was very, um, uh, it was very successful for me. Now here's a, a photo album or scrapbook that I made as a kid. And you can see it's all falling apart. So I consulted with the conservator and he told me to just gently clean and box. I mean, the pages are, are Acidic. I'm really not going to look at it very often. So putting, cleaning and putting it in a box is really a, a simple and easy thing to do. Um, there are all kinds of boxes and containers. And if you can, even if you start with a shoe box and then move up, having your things out of the light, out of dust, is an excellent way to start. And um, I have one, one here just to show you as a sample. And this one happens to have a little pull sleeve so that you're pulling on the sleeve and not the item. Um, but these are all different kinds of containers. And we have catalogs, I'm pretty sure, here tonight that you can look at. And our experts can help talk you through what would be the best. But you've got. Uh, boxes and folders and all kinds of things. I uh, used these for my cook. I had two children's cookbooks that um, I'm the oldest of seven, so this cookbook went through seven kids. And, um, and then I wanted to use them for my kids, but it's pretty falling apart. So what I did is I put it in a, a, a little four flap that's uh, glued onto a booklet. You can purchase these through the catalogs. And my kids knew then to be real gentle. They still cooked from it, but they took a little extra care. And I could store it with my other cookbooks to uh, save, save the wear and tear. And this is one I, another one for uh, my bread recipe book that I did. And my husband collects tools and tool catalogs. And so uh, his catalogs, we've picked out different boxes of size. And here I put a little paper sling that he can pull to get out these little booklets. This one has a flap that, I don't know if you can see, that pulls down. So then he's not putting his fingers in to pull it out. He can gently pull it out. Things to think about as you move into archival boxes. Um, I took 10 years to do my wedding album. And this card was on top of this card. And even though it was out of the dark, in the dark, out of sunlight, it still faded. So if I had done this right away, I wouldn't have this little mark here. But, you know, you just go as fast as you can. Um, for those of you that have letters, I'm sorry about this slide. It says do not, but you know, keep your keep staple. Don't use staples, uh, paper clips, glue. Don't laminate. Uh, 
post-it notes have sticky on them, it's going to leave a trail. Rubber bands will make things curl. Uh, don't ride on them unless you need to, and then if you do, use pencil. Uh, don't store them with paper clips or with newspaper clippings. Clippings are very acidic, and it will color, as you just saw from the previous slide, it will color your letters. Um, and then be careful in what you store them in. So store flat unless they're too brittle. If they're already folded and brittle, consult a conservator to see how to get access to them. Record the dates um, and biographical information about the person on something. And uh, if you need to write on it, use a number two pencil. Then write around the edges. I also wanted to send, tell you, if you want, I spent a lot of money to get my newspaper clippings deacidified. I want to show you this one right here. The only thing I did was I stored this newspaper clipping into against an archival uh, buffer paper and, and then some archival plastic. And it's still as good as it was 20 years ago. Um, I have this up here because my uncle laminated an article, and you can see what happens to that. Use uh, archival plastic uh, sleeves because you can pull those out, but once it's laminated, it's, it's next to impossible to undo it. You can, for those that are really, really important, you can purchase uh, archival mist that will deacidify to some extent. I mean, Paper, newspaper is real pulpy, but um, you, I th you used to be able to get this from, from Target. I don't know if you still can or not. Uh, it's fairly, it's a little bit expensive. You might want to go in with a friend on it, but these are just different things for newspapers. If you have a, a painting uh, that you that you want to, this is a picture that my, one of my kids drew and I wanted to frame it. Um, and since I don't have the equipment at home to do this, I took it to a local framer and asked for museum quality framing. And you see the, uh, the matting around the edge keeps the print away from the glass. If you don't have that and it gets a little moisture, you're your picture will adhere to your um, glass. I asked for UV filter plexiglass. And see, there's little bumpers back here. That'll keep, allow air to get behind your, your, um, your picture. And in 93, I got a lot of calls with people saying, I've got mold on the backside of my wall hangings. And this will help reduce, reduce that. Um, it's all archival, except this paper is not. And it's far enough from everything that I think it's okay. But if it's something that you really, really care about, ask how the back paper is going to, what kind that, what the quality is. Um, if you've got a, something that's really, really um, precious to you, you may want to, you might want to think about doing getting a copy made. Uh, this was my grandfather's confirmation certificate that was found. You can see it was in several pieces. It was found when my dad was cleaning out his real estate and he gave me these pieces and said, you're a preservation librarian, you can take care of it. Well, I have no conservators who can take care of it. And the conservator asked if I wanted to have this filled in with, uh, with liquid paper to make it look more whole. And I said, no, I want the artifact to tell its story, too. And I chose to leave that um, as is. Um, my, we adopted our children from Korea. And I'm sure you have uh, baby things that you would like to keep, too. And so I wanted to keep their clothes that they came over in. And what I did was I used archival quality tissue paper. And I stuffed the toes of the shoes with the tissue and then wrap them so that, so that they were lightly and not, so there was a, a soft fold 
um, to keep those. I also have a quilt that, uh, that I put in tissue, but you can use unbleached, pre-washed muslin, and we have someone who can really go into way more depth than I can on textiles. I know just enough to take care of my own stuff or be dangerous, I'm not sure which. But um, this is a little sample that I pass around of, of a tiny quilt that's been, that you can, you can look at. So we're now into the digital age and most cameras now save our images as JPEGs. Some of your higher end will do TIFF or RAW, more like RAW, RAW scans. And your, most of your home scanners will do 300 uh, DPI. Um, you might want to experiment if yours can go higher, especially if you're doing an 8 by 10, you might want to go up to 600. But I would experiment if you can go higher. Your slides, these are kind of, whoops, your lower, your lower end uh, recommendations. Um, always save your original photograph and your, or your original scan. If you're doing any editing, you want to you know, mess around, change the tone or do cropping, make a new image and work with that. And if you want to make a hard copy, use the paper and ink that's recommended for your copier. And what I do, which may be a little extreme, but I'm a preservation librarian, um, I make a copy and then I throw it in water to see if it's going to, um, how stable it is. And most will survive. But if it doesn't, you might want to think about getting a different uh, copy scanner. And then think about how you're going to store your images. I sometimes think a shoebox is easier to deal with than all your photogra digital photographs floating all over the place. And we take, tend to be shutter happy now that we don't have to pay for all that film. And this is just an idea, an example of ways that you can uh, organize your photographs. You can most recommend to organize by year and then event, but there's no reason if you have Christmas every year, you could have a Christmas and go by year. And then it doesn't hurt, I'm using the wrong thing, it doesn't hurt to have, uh, to rename your image because the camera will give numbers. Just make sure you don't override the JPEG and don't use dots. Use a dot JPEG. If you add dots, that's why they're using underscores. If you add dots, your computer is going to think that you have a, pr a different program that's needed to open it up. You won't be able to open it. So leave, leave, that, um, leave the dot JPEG or TIFF or whatever dot bit, whatever your camera is capturing in and then rename from this end. Uh, your VHSs and, and older formats capture uncompressed if possible and check to see what the current uh, capture is. I really recommend that you discuss with your vendor and then keep your, keep your original and store in more than one type or one place. Um, I use external hard drives, and I've got two in two different places in the house. Uh, these can break off here, and these can, the, all three of these can fail. So uh, you, you really want to think about backing up. Then there's always lovely lines for you to draw to write on, but if you do, you risk poking and uh, causing some damage. So it's best to, to write in here. And I just got a little diagram of what a CD-ROM is made of and, and the DVD just to 
to show here's where your reading is. Just to, when you're looking at, you like say textiles or whatever, when you're thinking about doing your, your preserving your items, and you're working with a certain type, be aware of the exceptions. Silk can shatter, so you need to know how to store your other materials and fabrics can take a little more abuse. And they don't need to be quite as gentle. So you need to really know how to handle your silks. Blueprints can fade. And charcoal, we say, oh, you can do plastic on your items. Well, if you put plastic over, over your uh, charcoal, it'll lift the charcoal right off your, your, the page. And gloves, I, we're more going away from gloves. I recommend you use gloves when you're working with photographs and with negatives, but if you're using gloves to handle uh, objects, gloves can be slippery and you could drop it and break it. So that's just something. And I keep, I've said a couple times, so leave the repairs to experts. This table we didn't realize had been restored. And you see these little wooden pegs there? That was so that this piece could float uh, and move when the humidity in the winter, when it got dry, and then when it got humid. Well, whoever did this glued this onto here so this can't move, and the table is cracking. It's splitting. Um, so it's self-destructing. So incorrect repairs can destroy your item. Um, added protection, whatever you're doing, think, can I reverse it? Is something new going to come along? Or will I, you know, new? So be able to reverse it. Make backup copies. Try to store your original separate from your copy. Think about if you need insurance. Think about if, if how to deal with a disaster and then monitor your collection. You have to think about is my stuff out of date. Do I need to recopy it? Here I, I made an oral transcript of my grandfather's uh, when I did an oral recording of him. Uh, this is, of course, way out of date. And I, I made some copies. So I've got all kinds of copies here. Uh, I can always go back to the paper. Uh, I said about boxing. This was in 2008. This was at the Czech Museum when we popped the box open. There's crinkling, but no. This had this box had mud, an inch thick on it. But you can't. I mean, it came out just well. It's wrinkled, but it's still there. And this um, is a book that a local citizen put in her freezer, and and then brought to us a year later, and then we helped uh, restore it. But if you get something, keep in boxes, and if you get something wet. Uh, call us or sh shove it in your freezer and then consult with us later. You can, um, there is an emergency response and salvage phone app now for those of you that have <laughs> your Blackberries and Apple devices. If you do that search, it's free and it's, a re it's really cool. You can look up textiles or whatever, and it'll tell you how to deal with them should they get wet. And this I talk about monitoring. I did this before I knew about the plastic uh, archival tabs. This is, I didn't realize that this was acidic, and the, back, the one from the back side is eating into the front side of my photo. So, uh, that was kind of a whirlwind. Let me see if I missed, I think I missed, I'll send around a few things. And if you've got a couple questions before we turn you loose to experts, here's some boxing samples. Here is a photo page. Okay. And then here are the different kinds of photo, uh, plastics that you'll see in your catalog. So... So anyway, um, you can either ask a few questions now, or um, yes. Archival mist 
So Wait, just, the archival myth that hang on, you just asked a sec. about, you want him to ask? Yes, yeah. you're live on TV, so if you, <laughs> we're on TV, so if you speak in there, <laughs> then everyone at home will hear too. Thank okay. you. Well, you don't have to stand up, you can see mm, this. My <laughs> question is, uh, the archival mist, mm -hmm. is it only useful for acidic paper, or can you use it for any paper? Um, we tend to use it for archival, but we have a program at our university where we use it before the paper becomes acidic. So you could use it on really good quality paper. It would add another buffer to your paper. And can you use it for a painting, a watercolor that is acidic um, paper? I would only do that with expert advice. It's supposed to be real stable, but we usually, if we're going to do something like that, we would send it to mm -hmm. a conservator to deal with. Thank you. Yeah. Do we have more questions? No? No, oh, good. You have an expert here, so. Uh, if you're a, uh, uh, the family genealogy person, mm -hmm. and you, are, you receive things from all sides of the family, and then you start amassing all these things. So I, I'm interested in your decision-making process for preservation of some things, um, and with the intent to hand down to some generations. And if your family's not too extended, um, but you can't project too far in the future as to if this child or this child is going to have more children, you know, right. at some yeah. point. How do you manage that? And how do you manage the real estate of photo albums and, and um, uh, uh, clothing and all sorts yeah. of things that you start, people start giving it to you to hold on? That gets to be really difficult. <laughs> I, I get, as you might have guessed, I get all of those things. Uh, it's hard because uh, you'll get these boxes of photographs that aren't necessarily labeled. If you've got the time, if you can take the time to sit down with people to identify those photographs, at least as a minimum, and keep them in boxes for photographs, that's a good first step. Um, we just started dealing with uh, letters from, we, we um, found letters that my dad wrote to my mother. And of course, everyone would like to have access to that. Well, with digital age, what I'm going to do is, what I plan on doing is, is working with a nephew, establishing a website, and scanning those uh, letters so that everyone can have access to them. Um, the certificate that I showed you a copy of, well, like you say, there's only one piece and how do you distribute it. I made copies of those. I kept the original, but I made copies and distributed the copies. Um, but it is, like I say, it's a big challenge and it's a, it's a huge responsibility. So uh, if you can get people to help you with the labeling, I think it's, in one way, it's nice to have it all in one place where people know that this is who I can come to. But like I say, it does get to be a challenge. And I haven't been real super good about it. But every once in a while, I'll find someone who will help me at least label. But one of the things to be careful of, photos that are labeled on the back, be careful. Uh, don't assume that it's correct, because uh, sometimes they wrote the name of the person they were going to give it to. So you have to be be a little bit careful with that. So. Uh, some of the follow-up question. Um, the, um, we, we received, uh, we cleaned out a great aunt's house mm -hmm. a couple weeks ago. As part of that, we received the immigrant trunk oh. from, from the Czech Republic or Bohemia at yeah. the time. So we have it. Um, the, per, the person we were working with, part of the family, she was going to give it to the Czech Museum mm -hmm. in Cedar Rapids. And we said we would take it um, and, and probably do the same after we're done with it. Mm -hmm. um, items that are that large, um, I'm, I'm interested in any ideas for real estate management in your own house yeah. uh, when you re start receiving large things. Well, the donation, especially when there's an <laughs> obvious fit, is a, is a good idea. 
what, what we've done is uh, certain pieces got handed down to certain children. And so I have my grandfather's Victorola that then went to my dad, that went to me. Uh, so we've done some of that kind of, kind of management. But it, it is real difficult. But what we've done as a family is make those joint decisions and picked out certain pieces that we'll each hand down to our, our children. But yeah, it gets pretty, dis you can imagine after three, gener three or four generations, it gets real dispersed. Mm -hmm. And, and so your choices are museum or, or to do something like that. Yeah. Oh, here you, go. you talked about um, getting a conservationist to do some of your mm -hmm. work. Where do you find these people? You know, we're loaded with them here in Iowa City. You're so lucky. And you're going to meet some tonight. But we, at the conservation, you can always contact us, and we'll help you find uh, the appropriate individual. And you're going to meet some tonight. Uh, we have a wonderful uh, book and paper lab. And we do help uh, on a limited basis. If we've got the time and the, that we can work things in, We'll do single pieces such as certificates or a cookbook or, or whatever. Um, but we will help you find the conservator that you need. We have all kinds of uh, book binders in Iowa City and, and people who have knowledge of textiles. So we're loaded. We're, you're very lucky to be living in Iowa City. No, that's the, you have, yeah, it's, and, and you can't even, there's supposed to be a directory of conservators and the conservators don't even sign up and fill out the information so that they can be on the, in that directory. The best is to consult a conservator, which we have, and we can get that through that number, and then network. And there are several different uh, conservation labs around the, the country, so I would, you know, contact us and we can get you there. Do, do we have more questions? Oh. Uh oh. Question? No, it's not a <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Emily always asks hard questions. No, it's not. I promise. Um, so you talked about um, uh, being discerning when selecting supplies that you're going to use to rehouse things like photographs or letters. Right. So when you're look, thinking about envelopes and folders and boxes, what are some of the things to look for or to avoid? Um, for photographs, there's a thing called now PAT. And I think it stands for photo active test. But it's a, it, they go through a very uh, rigorous test. And so if you've got something for photographs, look for that PAT. Um, and also look for things like lignin-free. That means that it's, if there's lignin in it, it's, it's going to cause a lot of dust and debris. So you want to look for lignin-free. Look for words like archival or... Um, non-acidic or alkaline, especially if you see the alkaline and, or, or pH, if it says how much pH, uh, I think the standard for now for, fo for paper and boxes is pH 8. Um, but yeah, that's a good question because you've got to be really careful. I, just for kicks, I went on a little buying spree <laughs> And I bought a little plastic album that said um, non-acidic. Well, you use that word for paper, not for plastic. But the manufacturer knew to say non-acidic, people will buy it. So you have to be really, really careful and read, read into the label. Because non-acidic for plastic is meaningless. You want to see inert or the type of plastic. So uh, the, the uh, catalogs that we have out in the list that we're giving, look at those and see how they're describing before you 
go like to Target, which is mixed. It has some things that are archival and some that aren't. So. Well, <clears throat> I can't think of a, a better program for Weber Days about local history than the preservation of local history and to have an expert here and many other expert here, experts here. So first, will you join me in thanking Nancy for her presentation? And then Colleen is going to, to tell us who our conservators are and where they'll be sitting. And then we'll turn off the camera and you guys can all go and ask your questions. How's that sound? Great. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Colleen Tyson, and I'm the Outreach and Instruction Librarian in Special Collections at the University of Iowa Libraries, Special Collections and the University Archives. And uh, I wanted everyone to be able to introduce themselves because I found out that um, a lot of our experts that are here tonight are, we, we put some categories around, but they're prepared to answer questions about far more categories than I put on their uh, signs. So do you, would you all be willing to come up to the front? Great. <laughs> um, so if Catherine, if, oh, all right. Um, well, I'll, so I briefly introduced myself, and myself and Catherine Mormon from the Old Capitol Museum will be sitting right up here at the front at the, f at the table for photographs to answer questions about any photographs that you've brought with you. Uh, I'll step take one moment to step back and say that uh, all of us will be sitting at these tables from this point out for the evening to answer any questions that you have. Um, if you've brought something with you, we'd love to talk to you about the items that you've brought and answer questions about them. But feel free just to uh, walk up and ask us questions about anything that you have at home that's, that, that is one of these formats or anything else. And we'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. It doesn't have to be just about an item that you've brought with you tonight. Um, so with that, I will, I'll go this way first and then we'll, we'll step back. Uh, hi, uh, I'm David McCartney. I'm the university archivist in the Department of Special Collections. I work with Colleen uh, in, in the same department and I'll be in the, uh, at the center back table. Uh, I'll, I'll uh, try to address your questions concerning film, uh, audiovisual materials and paper documents. Hi, I'm Gary Frost. Uh, I'm the conservator emeritus uh, from the library system here at the university. I, I have a fun presentation tonight because uh, it relates to heirlooms being fun and what you can do uh, beyond scrapbooking with a photocopier to make uh, distributed uh, copies of different uh, kinds of uh, documents that you have. So I'm, I'm looking forward to a fun exchange. <laughs> Great. Here you are. Thank you. Uh, my name is Emily Shaw. I am the digital preservation librarian at the University of Iowa Libraries. Um, but I do have some background in physical preservation, so I'm not strictly digital. Um, so feel free if, if, the, you know, if your questions span physical and digital things to ask away. Or f first and last oh. moment on camera. Yes. Um, We're preserving local history. And you're well, fantastic. Well, I'm Bethany Davis. I'm the digital processing coordinator librarian at the University of Iowa Libraries. Which, long story short, that means I scan things. So if <laughs> if you have any you know photos or, or documents that you're thinking about scanning, ask ask those questions of me. Hi, I'm Sarah Horgan. I'm with the Museum of Natural History, and I am the museum educator, but I have a background in natural history collections, specifically um, archaeological artifacts and fossils and bones and things like that. So I'm kind of the odd duck out here, but if you have any questions, I'm happy to help. I'm Shala Ashworth. I'm the associate director of the Old Capitol Museum, and I'm here to talk about textiles, uh, modern toys, old toys, wood, kind of a catch-all of anything you might have that's odd and unusual. Uh, I'm Catherine Mormon. I'm from the Old Capitol Museum. I work with Shala and Sarah. And my background is in art and design, and I emphasized uh, photography um, with my undergrad. And so I love to talk about black and white photography and um, the preservation of, of it um, and other items as well. So I'm glad to be here tonight um, with everyone. So, yeah. Okay, Thank so you. 
So that's our team. So we're going to spread out to our tables and feel free to come up and ask us any questions that you have. We've also prepared a booth over here with um, handouts from vendors that sell the types of products that Nancy talked about if you're looking for some place to find these things. Um, and different handouts about preserving different types of materials. So please help yourself. and. Uh, Patrick Olson, one of our special collections librarians, will also be here to help you if you have any questions about these pamphlets or or anything else um, about the handouts that he can help you with. So that's our team. Promote that one. Oh yes, and uh, <laughs> we have so many copies of this one. Gaylord is a is a particularly well known brand of archival products, and they've sent this guide to collections care. We have one of these for everybody, so we highly recommend that you take one of these home with you. Um, it covers paper, photographs, textiles, and books. So lots of good advice in this one, and there's a copy for everyone. So I think that's all that I have. <laughs> Thank you all for coming, and go visit the particular tables or all the tables if you have questions. <laughs>